I get a ton of questions from people who are considering purchasing an Audi RS7. So in today's video, we're going to talk about everything you need to know before you buy an Audi RS7. This is my 2016 RS7. It's finished in Nardo Gray. It's got the carbon exterior pack, just over 30,000 miles on it. It's been great for me so far. It's a pretty high option example, so we'll be able to talk about some of the most important options. The first thing you have to decide is what model year are you going to purchase? And that will affect whether it's a C7 or C7.5 generation. Those are the codes for this generation of RS7. C7 in America came out as a 2014 and a 2015 model year, and then starting with the mid-cycle refresh is 2016, 2017, and up. So my car is a C7.5. The first generation was just the RS7. Neither one, we didn't get the RS6 Avant in America, so you're choosing between RS7 and RS7. But for the refreshed car, the C7.5, they added a RS7 Performance, which is essentially the same car, same body, same powertrain, but it makes more horsepower. It's 605 horsepower. You could have carbon ceramic brakes as standard. It had the dynamic ride control, things like that. Much more expensive too. Unfortunately, I do not have a C7 to put right next to me to do a back-to-back -back comparison between the two of them, but I've spent time in both of them. I've driven, uh, obviously, my C7.5 2016, but I've driven uh, first-generation RS7s too. The most immediately ob obvious noticeable thing on the refresh is the exterior design. So new headlights, new style there, which changed the front bumper. The front grille shape changes slightly too. And then around back, it has also different taillights. The taillights have, are like more modern looking. Let's see, if I unlock the car, actually, you should be able to see if I can find the car key in my pocket. From a powertrain perspective, it stayed essentially the same. It's a four liter twin turbo V8, 560 horsepower, 516 pound feet of torque, ZF eight speed automatic transmission, all wheel drive with Quattro. Although there was a slight change, the compression ratio change, which meant, which was really interesting early on, a C7 car, tuned aftermarket would make more power and it was a little bit faster than the C7.5 RS7 with a similar style of tune. And I believe it was looking on the forums and such, it was traced down to a change in the compression ratio. And also technically, I think the engine has a slightly different code, but for all intents and purposes, it's the same four liter twin turbo V8. It's a hot V, makes 560 horsepower and 516 pound feet of torque. The RS7 performance, like I mentioned earlier, makes more at 605 horsepower, and this engine is related to the one found in the S6, S7, and the S8 of this generation, but obviously it makes more power. The RS7 has the biggest turbos that you could get um, in this 4.0 family from the factory. Other changes from the C7 to C7.5 generation, RS7 occurred on the interior. So most refresh cars 2016 and up have a flat bottom steering wheel that's what's standard my car was optioned with the heated steering wheel the heated package so i got heated steering wheel plus heated rear seats and that meant it goes to the round steering wheel so all the first gen cars had a round steering wheel most of the refresh ones you'll see will have a flat bottom steering wheel the other thing is mmi has been slightly updated so we have the digital screen in the middle here with the analog clusters on either side and then the screen that comes out, that's all the same between each model, but slightly updated system between the two years. One last thing I wanna mention of a difference between the C7 and C7.5, on the refresh car, the heads-up display became standard equipment, which is something nice to have too. Otherwise, on the inside, everything is essentially the same, the same kind of seats, the same quilting pattern, carbon fiber interior trim was an option. You've got your controls there and the center cluster. So now you've decided what model your car you want to get, whether you want a first gen C7 or the refresh C7.5. Obviously there will be a price difference. The earlier cars will be cheaper. So decide your budget, decide what year, what equipment that you like to have that's different between the two of them. Styling is a big factor. Some people think the first generation headlights, the DRLs look cooler than the refresh ones. I personally really wanted the updated car. I wanted a C7.5. So now you've decided that. The next big thing you need to know about the RS7 when you're buying one, there are a couple known problems with them. Overall, it's a pretty robust, I want to say reliable vehicle, but affecting all the four liter twin turbo V8s, the turbo oil screen issue is quite a significant issue. It's extremely prevalent on earlier cars and especially S6 and S7. So there's a little screen that is a filter and it can get clogged up. And when that gets clogged up, the oil can't get through 
and that starves your turbos of oil and you blow your turbos, which is not a fun time. Nobody wants that to happen and it's quite expensive. And it's happening, initially it seemed to be happening at the higher miles, these S6s and S7s with 70,000, 80,000 miles, but then it started appearing on even lower mile cars that were stock, they weren't tuned. Audi seems to have sort of acknowledged that there is an issue, there are revisions. There's a TSB, I believe, out for it, and they've revised it up to like in the G level of the screen. But even then, there were still problems. And the big thing was, it was happening out of warranty for a lot of these people. They're blowing their turbos, and all of a sudden, that's a ten dollars to $12,000 job if you go to a dealer. Even independent shops, it's going to be expensive. It's a lot of labor. Some people took that opportunity to either preemptively change it. They either redid their screens when they uh, had the car apart for something, or some people removed the screens entirely. Some people, their turbos blew, so they went, all right, I'm gonna throw my, R I'm gonna go buy RS7 turbos and put them on my S6. Or some people went, all right, even bigger, I'm gonna go 800 horsepower upgraded hybrid turbos or something crazy. Absolutely something you have to be aware of. Something that allegedly is able to combat it that a lot of people have done and I have done on my car is, 5,000 mile oil change intervals more frequently, keep it clean, get it flushed out. So every 5,000 miles, absolutely do an oil change on the RS7. And then it's something to definitely look for, see what revision, there are model years going out. And I believe Audi kept expanding it to, I think up to 2018. So it's like everything, RS7, RS6, S6, S7, even the S8, A8s. So that's a big issue. There was also the PCV um, problem too. And I think another thing was issued from Audi regarding that. And it's very obvious when it goes wrong because it's like screaming loud whistling noises. Uh, that one, my car luckily has not had that issue either. But these are two major things that you absolutely have to be aware of and are very commonly known to be a problem. You can talk to your service advisor at your Audi dealership about it. Um, if they've, they definitely have had some 4.0s in for work. Otherwise, in my knowledge and my experience so far and all my friends who have owned um, RS7s, nothing else massively catastrophic. Uh, I mean, air suspension is air suspension. Things can go weird with that. You have to be careful, but uh, that's been okay. Transmission has been pretty solid as long as you leave everything stock. Uh, and then the other big resource, check out the forums and the Facebook groups. Really valuable people with great technical knowledge, their testimonials from what happened to their car and what they ended up doing, going to whatever shop. So I, I know I spend a good amount of time on Audi Zine when I'm shopping for a vehicle, doing the research, or when anything goes wrong and I need to figure out what to do, I check out the forums too. The next thing, budgeting for how much this car is going to cost you. It's a very expensive vehicle. So when brand new, they were over $100,000 starting. My car was equipped at 130 grand and they have depreciated, they've come down because that's what, that's what cars do, especially high-end luxury performance cars. But even if you can buy one of these for anywhere between 55 to 75, $80,000, it still has many of the ownership costs associated with a six-figure luxury vehicle, high-end German car. So it's gonna be quite expensive and you have to take into account how much it's gonna to cost to own this car. So for that, I actually totaled up how much I spent on my car to own it for a year, and it came out to a total amount of $26,000 in one year. Now, you have to check out the full video. I broke it all down. There were caveats. Some of them were upfront costs, like sales tax, that I wasn't able to amortize over many years. Uh, some other ones were optional. I spent almost nine grand on things like paint protection film, new wheels, tires, those are not something that every single car is gonna have to do. You might find a car that already has paint protection on it and it's already been tinted. You might find one that comes with multiple sets of wheels and tires. That's just savings for you. But to be aware, there are many costs that come with this vehicle and you have to know how much it costs. I mean, I spent a staggering amount and a big part were things like brakes. Brakes on an RS7 are quite expensive. They will definitely, rotors will need replacing between 20 to 35,000 miles. It's a heavy car, it's a 4,600 pound car. It's very fast, obviously, lots of power, and it's just physics. The brakes don't last 50,000 miles. You're not gonna do that. Maybe the RS7 performance with ceramics can do that, but the regular steel ones, you walk into a dealership and they're like, I'd like new brakes for my RS7. They'll be like, okay, that'll be $4,500 or something in that range. Just sourcing parts, $2,200 is really a getting a really good deal. Check out the video I made. Um, I included a link that kind of showed the breakdown of where you could source these parts from OEM level and or replacement ones that like some of the brake pads will create less dust than the OEM ones. Ownership cost is something you absolutely have to consider. Budget for it. It's going to be pretty high. It's a high performance vehicle that costs a lot. Just don't be surprised 
for example, I mean, just look at the, how much I spent. That's that's me, the amount of dollars that left my bank account on this car. Was it worth it? I think so. I love this car. It's been great. It's been a really fun year with it. It does everything I wanted to do, but you have to be aware of that. If you want to see more details and see where the numbers broke down, check out that video too. As we move along our imaginary helping you buy an RS7 and cover everything you need to know before buying it, we've reached the point where you're trying to find a specific car. Uh, how do you decide that? You got to look at what options are available. So we're going to talk about the most important options on an RS7. How do you decide between all the cars out there for sale that are listed? Color obviously is a very personal preference type of thing. I love Nardo Gray and I was very happy with it. When I was shopping, I really wanted to find a car with an Audi exclusive paint like Nagaro Blue or something, but those are very rare and typically come with a significant price premium. It was hard to find. I settled for Nardo Gray, but I love it. It looks amazing. A couple other color options. Obviously, there's a white. There's the Daytona Gray. A friend of mine just bought a red one. It looks really good. Uh, I think Masano Red Pearl. So pick your color, but the specific options that are going to be critical. I personally absolutely want to bang an Olufsen sound system. So what do you get with B&O? It is a very expensive option from the factory, but you got metal speaker grills and the little tweeters rise up out of the dash. Uh, it, it is expensive. It does sound really good. So it was a little bit for personal preference. The base system is a bow system, which sounds plenty good too. And obviously you can go aftermarket and spend money and upgrade that. But in terms of a resale, in terms of aesthetic appeal and knowing that I had the top tier option, Bang Olufsen sound system, I wanted B&O. The next thing is the seats. You don't want the comfort seats. I just won't, I would not do it. I would not recommend. So these are what the sports seats look like in the RS7. They're still very comfortable. They have that really cool quilting pattern on there. They are heated. You don't get cooled. You don't get massage. If you get the comfort seating package in the RS7, you will have heated, cooled, and massage, but they look like sofas. They don't look like they belong in a RS7. Uh, I wanted the sport seat in the car, and I absolutely think you need to option it, get it with the sport seats. You might have a little more comfort if you get the comfort seats, but I believe that will worsen resale because it does not look as good. People buying an RS7 want something sportier. They want that quilting on, the, quilting on the seats. The comfort seats I don't think are a good decision in terms of resale on the RS7. If it's an S8 or something, heck yeah, that's a more luxury oriented version of this car. Suspension is something else you have to look at. Air suspension is one of the big perks of this car because it allows it to ride very comfortably. It still handles pretty well. You can change the ride height and change how stiff it is. If you throw it in dynamic, but it will lower the car and it'll stiffen it and help it handle a bit better. The other suspension option is DRC, dynamic ride control, which has sportier steel springs and DRC dampers that are linked with hydraulic fluid diagonally across the car. And it really helps the handling, the cornering, eliminate body roll. And it's absolutely gonna be faster with DRC. But the trade-off is it rides significantly more firm. I've driven both of them, liked both, but absolutely wanted air suspension for the versatility. Um, another perk of air suspension, through VAGCOM, VCDS, or other third-party different plugins and add-ons, you can control your air suspension through your phone and lower it even more. You can completely air it out if you wanted to. So for people who like doing that, you can make the car look cooler with that and still retain the functionality. Another thing you really have to note too, on the RS7 Performance DRC is standard. Most 2016s have uh, air suspension, the earlier cars, if you find something with a, I think it's dynamic edition, with red brake calipers, it most likely has DRC suspension. It does not have air suspension. An easy way to tell if it has air suspension is if you go into MMI, you see it says raise right there. You're not going to raise a DRC per se. This is for air suspension going up and down. And if I go to set my individual settings, there is a air suspension thing. I can change it between comfort, auto, or dynamic. Again, I chose air suspension on my car, so that's a big vote for air suspension. DRC definitely will allow it to handle a lot better, but in my opinion, this is a large luxury sedan. It's it's not a sports car. It's not like a supercar. I replaced my R8 technically with this, and I didn't ever expect it to handle the way the R8 would. With DRC, could it try to keep up a lot better? Absolutely, but I wanted air suspension. Another option that I think is pretty important is the driver assistance suite. So we've got this extra stock down here with adaptive cruise control. You can change the following distance and then we have lane keep assist that will help you stay in the lane. Coupled with the heads up display, it's a pretty nice suite. And this is something that, again, up to personal preference. Many people don't like the car having all those driver assists. They wanna be more involved. I remember very clearly once my friend John was like, 
I don't need adaptive cruise control. My right foot is my cruise control. It's a nice technology suite, and I always like to think about these things as potential resale. Will it make it easier to sell? Uh, I know a friend of mine has a 2014 RS7, and he's a little bit bummed that it doesn't have the adapt, uh, the full driver assist feature. So there was a driver technology package. You would definitely have to look out for that. I recommend it because when you're on a road trip on the freeway cruising along, it's nice to have adaptive cruise control because then the car takes care of accelerating, slowing down, and then lane keep assist is also nice too. That being said, if you've been in a more modern, more recent, advanced system, the one in the R7 will feel a little bit uh, less sophisticated. You feel more like a ping pong ball bouncing in between the lane markers. It clearly is seeing the edge and reacting to it versus looking and centering the car and keeping you inside the lane. So don't expect it to be something like the latest BMW or even Audi system or Mercedes Distronic Plus. It's not quite on that level of driver assistance yet. Couple other options that are worth noting that I think are pretty important to get. The sport exhaust is cool. It makes the car obviously sound better. When you put it into dynamic mode, it opens up the valve. So you will still have the quiet mode, but in dynamic, you get a lot of cracks and pops and it sounds better. I will insert a clip of the car starting up revving and making some cool noises right now. And then, like I mentioned too, the heated steering wheel package will delete flat bottom on the second generation cars. I really did want a flat bottom steering wheel because I think they look cooler and I like it too. But it was the, I mean, I couldn't find the exact perfect car because I was buying used. So that was the first thing that I eliminated. I was like, all right, I will make do with the round steering wheel. It has heated rear seats and a heated steering wheel. I'll, I'll settle for that one. But the one thing that I did not want to settle for is the exterior carbon fiber pack. It's really, really expensive to replace that or buy it and add it on. It changes actually, the diffuser is different for carbon versus non-carbon. There's an extra like horizontal slat on mine versus a regular black painted one or the silver one, the Alu Optics. Um, same thing with the front carbon grill surround and the front blades, they're really expensive the option. One thing I think mine did override, I have uh, body color mirrors, which was painted mirrors. Sometimes they either come in black or I think you can get carbon on the R7 Performance. Some of those things, yes, you want if you want to, you can replace them. They are replaceable. Um, I would prioritize things like the air suspension and banging Olufsen sound and driver assistance because you really can't add those easily. Whereas the paint color, you can wrap the car if you wanted. Wheels, easy to change. Those things aren't quite set in stone and as difficult to change. So figure out your priority. I covered a couple of the important options that I think are absolutely necessary to get. And one that isn't absolutely necessary, but I really like is I have the Alcantara headliner, which just feels very nice. Like everything, even like the uh, sun visors, the rear luggage cover over there for the trunk, the hatch is all covered in Alcantara, which is absolutely really nice and premium feeling. One thing we absolutely do need to talk about is the competitors. So you've settled on RS7, you like the car a lot. You maybe driven one, seen one, watched videos of them, and you want to own an RS7. But think about what else is out there. Even within Audi's family itself, the S7 and S6 has a very similar powertrain with the seven speed dual clutch and a little bit less power. Uh, and it definitely is a little less expensive, but you don't get the full RS badge. If you want more luxury, the S8 is a more luxurious vehicle. Uh, it's more comfortable in that regard, more conventional executive luxury sedan versus the RS7 being all sporty. If you look at the competitors, other companies, M6 Grand Coupe and the Mercedes CLS 63 were the two main ones going up against the RS7. The M6, the biggest downside for the M6 was it was rear wheel drive only. And having driven many M6s and M5s from the F10 generation, those, they struggle to put the power down even when it's dry and warm out. Like the traction light's always flying and just, it's, it's a lot of power. It's 560 horsepower too, I think. Yeah. Um, 
and a lot of torque to the rear wheels and we just light them up. So if you live somewhere if it, with inclement weather, rains, snows, it gets cold, it's not that great. I thought about an M6 Grand Coupe because I really like that car. I came close to buy an M6 before I picked up my i8 years and years ago. And I was like, how is it going to do in the winter? I mean, I, I'll put winter tires on it, obviously, and I'll leave it in like comfort mode and stuff. And I talked to a couple guys and like, it's still a little bit of a handful, even when you're in like comfort mode and you've got winter tires on. So it's, it's a tail happy rear wheel drive thing. So that definitely is a mark against the M6 or the M5 of the previous generation. Obviously the new one is all wheel drive, but that's a newer generation compared to these RS7s and it's more expensive too. The CLS has all wheel drive. The CLS 63, I believe is formatic as standard. Also a twin turbo V8, plenty of power, the nice cool styling. I personally didn't, I ruled it out immediately because I did not like the interior as much. I thought it felt a little more dated. Wasn't a huge fan of the center cluster. Personal preference, uh, I chose the RS7 also, air suspension, a little more comfortable. I think it looks better. I believe it's slightly faster too, but something you have to look at too. So those are the top three. Another thing we could also throw in there is a Panamera Turbo. You can get a earlier Panamera Turbo, Turbo S, similar levels of practicality, definitely a very nice interior and a higher price originally. It, it, uh, Panamera Turbo S was a tier technically above the RS7. It's something else you can look at. Styling, I think, is a little more polarizing for those. I think more people are going to love the RS7 looks compared to the Panamera, which wasn't always the prettiest looking car. But those are some of the other competitors. Now, if we go even more stretching in a different direction, if you're just talking about a fast performance sedan, CTS-V is something to look at. You can get a CTS-V wagon. Now, that interior tech and luxury is going to be a big step below what the RS7 offers. And again, no all-wheel drive, but if you're just looking for horsepower, a big old V8 making a lot of power, a CTS-V is a good option. Also, the Hellcat. In terms of max horsepower and performance for your dollar, it's very, very difficult to beat like a Charger Hellcat. But again, even more so than the CTS-V in terms of luxury, tech, interior, fit and finish, and prestige, that is a even bigger step below the RS7. But absolutely worth mentioning because it is such a massive amount of performance for the money. I personally was pretty set on RS7. I really wanted one of these, spent a good amount of time in them, really liked it, loved the practicality, the way it drove, the way it looked, the way it performed and felt. I was shopping with this and S8. I did look at a couple S8s as a consideration and then S-Class Coupe for me because I was like a very comfortable, luxurious, decently quick daily driver. That was what I was looking for. And I looked at an S550 Coupe, um, S63s were a little bit pushing the budget but that will obviously lose out in terms of practicality. Now, if you look even newer, you can get the RS5 Sportback for similar kinds of money, but again, that's the V6 versus the V8. It doesn't have air suspension. Those ride quite a bit more firm, and it's, it's a little, it's a, again, a tier below. It's a RS5 versus RS7. The bigger the number, the higher up the tier. Those are some of the big competitors in my mind that I would think uh, that come to mind immediately. And you can cross shop them. If you have questions about them, I've driven a significant number of them and having owned an RS7, feel free to DM me, comment below, Instagram, um, or email me if you have questions. Like, I can't decide between these two. What should I do? Is it gonna be an M6 or is it gonna be the RS7? Well, I faced that exact dilemma and obviously I decided I'm buying an RS7. So there's my endorsement. So to wrap things up, everything you need to know. I think I've covered very comprehensively all the things about the RS7. Before you buy, make sure you have a pre-purchase inspection done by an independent third party. Have them check all the mechanicals, the suspension, their brakes. Like I mentioned earlier, brakes are very expensive. So if you can try to see if they were replaced, if they're still brand new, um, or if they were still the original ones from the factory, see what life has left in them. You have to budget for that. It is quite expensive. Um, check oil change intervals. See if you can get the full maintenance records. See how much Audi care is still left in the car. Some of these cars, if they're under 45,000 miles, could come with two intervals of free service. And there's big ones, I think. 40, uh, 35,000 miles is the big one where they start flushing a lot of fluids and it costs quite a bit more. A lot of DIY support is out there too. You can, I mean, obviously an oil change you can do yourself. People are literally pulling off their turbos by themselves too and checking them to see if there's any play in the wheel. Uh, you can do the oil screen stuff yourself. It varies depending on your level of ability. Massive amount of resources out there. A lot of the technical groups on social media, the forums themselves, make some friends. It's a sport of, I've met a lot of really cool owners 
through my ownership of the RS7, talked to a lot of people. Absolutely love this car a lot. It's a great daily driver. It combines everything. Will I admit that it's a little bit overkill? Absolutely. As a daily driver, I mean, there will be sometimes three or four days in a row where I won't utilize 560 horsepower, but then I'll get that one little gap and I'll just floor it and be like, oh, that's why I bought this car. It is so fast. It builds speed so aggressively and it hides it so well too. It's so comfortable. And I mean, daily driving, I'll, I've taken this an hour and a half drive and it doesn't feel like anything. It's been great. In summary, I mean, I think I've covered everything you need to know, going from deciding what model you're to get, some of the problems to look out for, important options to consider and purchase, and then other things to be aware of when you buy an RS7. In the event that there is a question that you have that I haven't covered, definitely feel free to comment below, reach out on social media or via email. I will do my best to answer the questions, give you my opinion. If I know the answer, I can direct you somewhere. If I don't know, I'll direct you somewhere else to try to find the answer. Make sure you guys check out some of the other videos I filmed with this, the in-depth detailing of how much this RS7 cost me to own a year, which when I totaled up the number, I was like, what? <laughs> it, it caught me by surprise. Uh, otherwise, love this car. It's been great. If you have any questions, definitely comment below. Make sure you guys like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.